cars and other devices on the road will essentially create a dynamic mesh. Dare I say, flying cars. It's almost like being able to almost predict the future. The <laughs> app store, you're right. You're absolutely right. This is the main theme of our today's conversation. Welcome to the Internet of Things Equation, a podcast when I talk about the Internet of Things domain, both from the technical and business perspectives. I'm Kosz Malinowski, the Internet of Things advisor and trainer. My guest has over 20 years of experience in building companies, developing business strategies and conducting insightful market research. Today, we're going to discuss the next wave of data-driven disruption. Hello, John. Thank you so much for accepting my invitation. Hi, Lucas. Uh, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Please briefly introduce yourself to the listeners. Sure. Yeah, my name is John Cowan. I am a career early stage technology founder and CEO. You wrote an article uh, where you described the patterns that you saw in the industry. That article is titled Machines Are Eating the World. And you outlined the impact of smartphones on consumer behavior and their role as the device platform. Could you summarize that piece for the listeners? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, what I was attempting to do is explain using the analogy of or the, the, the historical significance of the smartphone as the basis to explain what I see or what I view as the next future economy to invest in. Generally speaking, innovation happens in cyclical patterns or almost predictable patterns. And having lived through the experience of how transformational the smartphone was on society and the economy, broadly speaking. I observe the connected and electric autonomous vehicle market as following a very similar pattern to the smartphone. As a researcher and a strategist, observing that, that pattern and seeing similarities can provide very interesting insights into what to build, perhaps, or when to build it, or what to invest in if that market of early stage innovation is something that you like. Could you characterize the term device platform that you use in your article? Sure, sure. So, so what was observational about the, the smartphone revolution, or I'll say transformation um, as, as an innovative platform, is that it was, it was driven by a physical device. When I say device platform, I mean a common piece of infrastructure, a common piece of hardware on which or from which an, an entire economy formed, right? The smartphone by itself is nothing really of useful value, okay? Not that a phone doesn't have any utility value or that not that a camera has no utility value, but by itself, it, it is not the basis of what made Apple, Apple or Google, Google, et cetera. It's everything that is built on top of and that utilizes that piece of hardware Right? That's what makes it a platform. That's what creates the economic value at scale. When I refer to it, the device platform, I'm, I'm talking about the device as a center of gravity, if you will, for development and economic opportunity. I love the way that you put it, because I use the same approach when I speak with my customers about the Internet of Things, that the IoT does not have any value on its own. It's just some kind of capabilities, some kind of hardware and software, but it doesn't do anything. And what is really right. important is the business aspect, as you said, those applications that actually deliver value to the end users. But the smartphones have done something very impactful, which is changing the consumer behavior. And I think this is really huge thing. Could you elaborate on that for a second? If you think about what the smartphone um, accomplished at a free utility, right, for you and me, is that it made our lives much easier. We were more connected. Um, we have a computer in our pocket. There's a, there's plenty of things that we can do uh, with that device, right? Um, historically, as we look back at the history of the smartphone, we, we now realize that it was a transformational invention, right? A piece of innovation that was a center of gravity for significant transformation in society. The way that we communicate, the way that we interoperate, the way that we do business is great, has been greatly affected by the smartphone itself. But observationally, the real value of it is driven by others. It's driven by application developers. It's driven by data integrators. It's driven by all of the different economic uses of the smartphone that, that are beyond just its, its utility value to you and me so that we can communicate. Speaking about the next thing, you mentioned that the connected vehicles 
are going to be the next device platform, the, the next step forward in terms of the capabilities. So what makes those uh, connected vehicles so special that you think that they will follow the, the smartphone revolution? Sure. And there are a few other themes that are, are uh, developing in real time around the idea of the connected and autonomous vehicle, right? The overarching theme that we observe is this progression in, in the evolution of automation, right? From where we were in IoT, like early IoT, towards completely autonomous machines, right? What I, what I describe in my own thesis as the era of autonomy or autonomous things. It's on its own evolutionary curve as a technology or an innovation that is going to radically alter society the way that the smartphone did, okay? The vehicle itself, the concept of the vehicle is observable as the next device platform because it has the potential to be the center of gravity for all of the economic development. And, and I observe using historical pattern matching, I observe Tesla as an example, as, as a very similar type of curve to that of Apple when it introduced the smartphone in 2007. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you, if you look at that pattern and you look at how, how much economic value Tesla has created as the pioneer of connected and autonomous vehicle development. You see a lot of similarities between the advent and evolution of connected and autonomous vehicles and the advent and evolution of smartphones. And so what I would argue is that as the connected and autonomous vehicle innovation and industry itself continues to evolve, you are likely going to see an economy form around it the way you saw an economy form around the smartphone because in order for in order for us to, to realize the true potential of connected and autonomous vehicles those devices are going to require an entire industry of software platforms which are going to be driven by independent developers they're going to require a whole new generation of um, interoperability and data exchange between other connected devices and machines okay and so that's, that's how I make the analogy. That's how I make the comparison that the connected and autonomous vehicle as a device platform is where the smartphone was in its early development um, as a transformational piece of machinery for society. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it was just an enabler. And those modern cars, those are essentially like the laptops on wheels, right? You've right. got tons of hardware inside right. that've got processing capabilities, we've got sensors. And what you said is crucial is that it's not about every single unit. It's about the ecosystem that, that right. they form. I have this, this philosophical conversation with different investors and, and theorists in this space about you know, Tesla and automakers and what have you, and, and you know, how they view them, they generally view them in isolation, right? As individual companies, profit loss and what have you. And what I would encourage is, is to not view them that way, right? I would view the vehicle. If you think about the vehicle as a platform, as a device platform, uh, and understand that as that platform continues to evolve, as technology does, there is going to be a much greater economy that forms around that. What I would argue is even greater than the smartphone, because what we're talking about now is is the kinds of solutions that are that are truly transformational. They're you know everything from public safety to efficiency to environmental sustainability. These are very big transformational things that will be impacted by the evolution of this device platform. And again, not that the smartphone was small in comparison. But this is going to be much more significant, I think, for society at large. If you observe that and you can, you, again, you can look at what we, what we did to build and invest in software that utilized the smartphone, it gives you a little bit of a blueprint to think about if you're an innovator, what should you be building or what should you be focusing on? Or if you're an investor, what should you be investing in? This is a great topic. Let's say I am an innovator. I've got some technical skills. So what I should be focusing on in order to write that connected vehicles wave? Well, I mean, there, there are, um, there are many choices, you know, depending on what your skill set is, but one of the most significant areas of development that I see as mo as exciting and both, and both challenging and rewarding at the same time is the evolution of artificial intelligence at the far edge of the network. 
right? So, you know, being able to innovate new and exciting inference models, for instance, for the processing and training of, of data that is utilized by machines. It is a significant opportunity, but it's also a very important building block to the future of what I would describe as intelligent autonomous infrastructure. So for example, just give you a, for example, you know, my Tesla, for instance, is limited in its ability to do self-driving because it has difficulty interpreting events going on around it that are not within the, the view of the sensors on board the vehicle. It is going to need to interpret information, processed information in very low latency real time that is produced by many other systems that are connected, other vehicles, pedestrians, phones, traffic infrastructure, real estate infrastructure, road infrastructure, all of these things are, pro are emitting and processing information. The handling of all of that in, in low latency, real time um, speed is an area of development focus that we, I think is a very interesting and intriguing um, pursuit because in order to continue to make that Tesla or that connected autonomous vehicle truly intelligent, it will need to, it will need to borrow from information sources that have been processed and trained by other systems. Even focusing on the way in which you interchange data, like if, you know, you're know, you an IoT expert, right? So the way that we traditionally do data handoff between systems needs to evolve. Like it, there, that needs to be more efficient. It needs to be more, there needs to be more open standards, you know, those kinds of things in order to attract the development community to innovate. First, we had that point-to-point -point integration between various systems and what you said about car being able to connect with all the surroundings and uh, gathering data is we are getting to that many-to-many -many type of communication instead of point-to-point. -point. And uh, we will transfer into the mesh network. So cars and other devices on the road will essentially create a dynamic mesh, interchange messages, and this way we can have that true autonomy. Because as you said, like every single device is not capable of working on its own because even those sensors are limited and they will be limited no matter what we will do in the future, right? There is only so much compute that you can put on board a device, right? What we're seeing is devices getting more expensive because, particularly IoT devices, because the, the short answer to solve the computational problem is to put computers on board the IoT device. I mean, we know if you, if you think about the scale, okay, if you, if you think about the, I, I recently calculated this for a project where I calculated the total surface area in square meters of the top 50 metropolitan areas in the United States that would need to be covered by IoT devices and sensors, okay? We're talking over a hundred trillion square meters of physical surface area. Even if you, even if you just focus on the dense urban cores, you know, it's still in over a trillion uh, square meters of coverage that, that has to be equipped with devices and sensors and things that capture information and, and process. It is simply too expensive to think about building those IOT devices with perpetually greater onboard compute capacity. Number one, you have physical space limitations. Okay. And number two, it's too expensive. Like these things have to go from, you know, $2,500, $2,500 US USD, a device down to $150. We have to get these things way down in cost. That's going to be very difficult to do if we have to include expensive GPUs on every device. So the, the answer to that theoretically is that the device should be much simpler. Okay. It should just do what it does. And from a software perspective, we should be able to borrow available compute capacity from nearby systems, whether that this is, you know, things people talk about things like edge computing or whatever, what, you know, edge computing to me is just a multi-tenant computer nearby that my software can use in order to process information that I don't have to purchase. I simply rent. I simply, mm -hmm. I simply consume it like a utility, you know, so if you, it, that sort of pendulum swing to more simpler devices that are borrowing compute capacity to do all of the, the kind of machine intelligence that's necessary, if you, if you observe that and realize that that pendulum has to swing, 
it, it uh, gives you an, a strong indication of where you might want to spend time developing, right? If you're an innovator or a startup, you know, somebody who can't get out of the startup world like me, you know, you just, you, you think about solving those problems because you know that solving those problems are going to be useful and valuable. Those are great points. And actually, I wrote uh, a small article myself a year ago about uh, that shared compute and storage at the edge because this is essentially what you said that we will have purpose-built devices that mm -hmm. are doing their stuff but if they need some extra compute for instance they can borrow it from surroundings essentially and of course yeah. you, you will have that machine to machine payment uh, so they can actually pay mm -hmm. for what so that's an entire other area of development, right? Is it, what, what, you know, what we call M to M or machine to machine commerce, right? Mm -hmm. the, the underlying payment and settlement system that we would rely on today to do that is, is probably inadequate, right? So, yeah. So thinking about how machines pay other machines as well is an area of development innovation. Again, whether you're in you're a, whether you are a startup innovator or you're an investor, it, that's another area that's definitely worth exploring. Mm -hmm. So what's your take on the blockchain? Because from my personal perspective, at its current state, it adds too much overhead in order to be feasible for that machine to machine transactions, because those are going to be atomic transactions that can happen at a high frequently, which doesn't yeah. really write uh, good with uh, blockchain. So what I would what I would say, broadly speaking, is that, you know, the, the concept of distributed ledger technology in some capacity probably has a role to play in facilitating the machine to machine payment and settlement system of the future. You know, I, you know, current, I'll, I would say current generation distributed ledger technologies are plagued by all, all kinds of issue but i mean they're not you know, i you know i don't as an innovator and investor i don't i don't get too concerned about the challenges that exist i expect there to be shortcomings and challenges for for early nascent technology like distributed ledger tech the point is you know how, how you direct effort and resources and capital to to solving them or perfecting them or improving them right but i would say i would say it's there's a strong probability that some form of distributed ledger technology will be part of the basis of a future machine to machine payment and settlement engine. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, just, you know, for, for clarification of that, you know, that does not necessarily mean cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm. That simply means the immutable ledger, you know, that, that can attest to the authenticity of a recording, a, a piece of information, as well as adjudicate micro transactions, because if I own an IOT device that's on an open network that's in, participating in the machine to machine economy, I might get fractions of cents for the, the utilization of that system. You know, I need to be able to facilitate what I call, you know, micro transactions, right? Uh, and so I, uh, I see the underlying concepts of distributed ledger tech likely part of the architecture of the future for payment and, and settlement systems for in the machine to machine economy. Mm -hmm. That was a great point that you made. I, I want to underline for the audience that because of the value of single transaction might be so small, then the ledger or whatever technology you're going to use to settle those payments needs to be extremely efficient because you, you cannot add uh, one dollar fee for no. two cents transaction, right? It doesn't calculate yeah. at all. Yeah, that's why, that's why I distinguish between distributed ledger technology and blockchain or cryptocurrency. Those are all very different things. Um, and, you know, obviously there are, there are, um, there are ways to make distributed ledger technology efficient, um, that don't involve the high computational costs, you know, with reconciling transactions on a ledger. It's possible that the distributed ledger technology that could, that could solve this problem exists today, but a more likely scenario is that we haven't seen it yet. The one, if you will, that helps to truly accelerate the payment and settlement system of the future. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. And actually, I see three areas that are holding back the true mass adoption of IoT, connected vehicles included, which is security, privacy, awareness, mm -hmm. and data exchange. Because we yes. try to solve those issues, but from my perspective, we still are far from doing that right. So what's your take on that? 
Well, like I said, I, you know, I, I definitely agree with security and I, and I, security is a pretty broad term. I, I think of the immutability of records of information as an important security feature for this kind of system. Obviously scalability is, is really important, which basically infers that you need a system that does not require a tremendous amount of resources in order to operate. You know, those are two areas. I think that areas of innovation, I think that are worth pursuing, you know, in the field of distributed ledger technologies. But again, you know, to the point I was making earlier, like if you were that startup executive or that founder or that CTO that developed a system that was useful, you know, to facilitate machine to machine commerce at scale, you can see how that would plug into the connected and autonomous vehicle platform market and become valuable. Right. And this is where, what I would, when I, what I describe as, you know, applying the original theory of data gravity to this future of intelligent connected infrastructure, right? Data gravity, which was a theory written by a friend of mine, uh, Dave Mercury, a long time ago to describe the, to, to, to describe what is observable in the platform economy effect. I think he studied salesforce.com originally as his basis of study, right? But what, what Dave observed is that the existence of data, the physical existence of data has a gravitational pull. It's like, it has a mass, it's like a planet that creates a gravitational pull and what it, what it's pulling toward it is apps and services. Okay. So where data exists, innovative developers like you are, are drawn to it because you're going to build an innovative system, a solution, a software technology, a platform itself, like based on the utilization of that data. What I see is, is that data gravity provides a bit of a prescription or a formula for intelligent infrastructure builders and investors, right? If you know, for instance, if you know that the data that gets created by a LIDAR system, for example, is going to create a gravitational pull of apps and services, right, which are driven by developers in this economy, wouldn't it make sense to invest in the deployment and operation of LIDAR infrastructure just at a high level, right? When we think about an investing theory, right, like I said, the data gravity investment theory, it is, or thesis is invest in the deployment and operation of intelligent infrastructure because you know that the, that an economy will form around it. The data is valuable. Whatever the, the data that that LiDAR system creates can be used by a plurality of apps and services to create value. And in, in that equation, there's monetization, which is why we build these things as, as venture capitalists and startup innovators. And so that's, that's what I'm getting at when I describe that. So it, it, it's the, it's the basic building block. Is, is to invest in intelligent infrastructure that is, is the, the basis of creating data that attracts the apps and services that creates the economy and which leads to prosperity at the end of the day, right? Whether prosperity for independent proprietors like you and me, prosperity for the investors that are underwriting this innovation, but also prosperity for the communities. The existence of economies creates a healthier tax base, which allows for the investment into better, safer infrastructure in the community, safer communities, more efficient communities that creates a gravitational pull for people to want to be living in those communities. And that, and that's how the cycle, the cycle works, right? It's, it's reciprocal in that nature, but pursuing an investment thesis that's very focused on infrastructure. But to me, it seems obvious, but obviously, you know, in our industry, we are at the tail end of a generation of investors that have only really cared about investing in internet software, right? You will find very few speculative investors, venture investors that want to invest in physical infrastructure things. This is probably due to the hype, the dot-com hype, right? Because before that, that was only hardware and hardware is hard by its very nature. And then we had software and software is way easier. I work with cloud infrastructure and if I mess something up, I can just turn it down and recreate like in a minute. And if you yes. uh, do something wrong with your hardware design, the cycle is way longer and it costs you way more money to solve the issue. Right. Right? Yeah. Yeah, the, the capital that you require to, to, to develop uh, hardware is much greater than software. And 
you know, the return on investment might take much longer. And that's, you know, it's a, that is a completely separate conversation to have. But, you know, this is why also like, again, why we talk about investment thesis, okay? Because we, I believe, and my, my firm believes that speculative investors should be paying more attention to physical infrastructure. Whether we call it IoT or we call it intelligent infrastructure, or we call it autonomous machines or what have you, it's the same thing. It's the idea that we're investing in physical infrastructure because it, cre it creates a gravitational pull of apps and services and where there are apps and services and economy forms and where there's economy, there's prosperity. Yeah, I, I agree with you that the name doesn't really change because it is you know just a hype cycle and people will figure out some new name to call the same concept, which is, as you said, we've got data sources and the, the connected vehicle is so huge okay. data source right okay and that, now you're so, so okay so when going back to the original point of the conversation about the connected autonomous vehicle as the next big device platform you know because you're in the industry and you understand how much data and how many sources of data can possibly come from a single vehicle okay and if we know now that the data is what's valuable that you know that, you know so we want to create gravity for data because data is the you can almost think of data as the new equity right in in the innovation economy the connected and autonomous vehicle produces a tremendous amount of data more data than i would say any iot device that you can think of now multiply that by the number of vehicles that are in distribution and on the road and will be in the future but then also layer onto your calculus the future of transportation which may not include just vehicles with four wheels you know, drone technology, navigation, you know, dare I say, flying cars, you know, all of those future innovation in transportation are going to depend on the perfection of the connected and autonomous vehicle economy that we're living in right now. We are, we are living in the very beginning phases of this economy, right? And that's, again, to the point of my, my research is if you can, if you know this, like that's very powerful, right? If you know, it's almost like being able to almost predict the future. If you know what comes next, because we've seen this pattern before, it gives you a blueprint for, again, if you're an innovator, what should you be building? Or if you're an investor, what should you be investing in? Yeah, I, I think those those are great points. And the term that I often use with my customers is that uh, the value of data is when you extract knowledge from that data. So to, to put it in, in your terms, when you've got applications or systems consuming that data, because that itself is almost like a smartphone. It doesn't do much. Like you need to somehow process it, extract pieces yeah. of it, connect this data from that data, and then you've got the value. So yeah, the ecosystem, the creating ecosystem, creating commerce within the ecosystem, I believe this is a great blueprint for whoever is starting uh, right. Right. Uh, right now. Mm -hmm. You know, and I would say, you know, you, know, you can't take a, uh, this is not a one or two year get rich investment model. You know, we're looking at a long horizon here. You know, we're looking at uh, the way that I view investing over the long term is 10 to 20 years of, of economic development, right? Much like the, the, the class of investors that realized that, that the nature of software was going to change from software built for my computers on in my office to software designed to be distributed and consumed using an internet okay it's like that right where you know that took many years to evolve and and become its own economy you know we see the same pattern the same evolutionary curve for the topics that you and i just just discussed and that's you know so we don't look at that as like oh a two-year investment thesis we look at that as a multiple decades we need to, to have the mature ecosystem for all of that to work. So having just a connected vehicle without all of that infrastructure around it, as you said, will not move the needle that far. We need to have the yeah. whole ecosystem and the uh, technology, both hardware and software, needs to be mature enough to create the foundation of that future economy. But if you think about that, what we learned about the history of the smartphone, right? Like what was, what was really the event that made the smartphone really take off. If you think about it, what, what was, what was the, what was the, what happened to make the smartphone take off? 
Have you ever thought about that? Like, if you think, reflect on it? From my perspective, that was the, the App Store, essentially. The App Store. You're right. You're absolutely right. The, the moment that Apple and Google made the Android and the, and the iOS device open to the developer community to innovate, as opposed to what killed research in motion, which is a closed model for applications, the moment that, 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 that the App Store turned the smartphone into a platform is the moment that everything started to shoot upward to the right in that, in that, in that economy. I believe the same pattern will hold true in those connected machines, whether it's autonomous vehicles or drones or, you know, what have you, the, the connected and autonomous vehicle industry will see the same thing. Imagine, for instance, what would happen if Tesla, just theorizing, opened its infotainment system up to developers the way that Apple opened up the App Store. Today, at, you know, everything that I consume inside Tesla is either written by Tesla internally, or it's just a connected service. Okay. It's just simply doing an API handoff to something else. But what if, you know, third-party developers could innovate at a software level and make all of that consumable and purchasable by the owner operator of the machine, right? That is going to be a, an event when that happens. And I don't think that we're that far away from that. I've been talking about that and, you know, if you, if you study, if you study the end user license agreement for a Tesla, you can almost see what's going to happen. <laughs> you can predict what they're going to do. And that's, I think that, you know, it's a similar type of event where you, where you open up the opportunity for third party developers to deploy, to, to create innovation and, and deploy software innovation, software technology onto a platform like that, you're going to see a very similar upward to the right growth trajectory for that economy. I understand, of course, that the, the connected autonomous vehicle is very different than a smartphone because there's a lot of safety considerations involved in that. But I would describe the event of an app store for connected and autonomous vehicles as inevitable. It's not an, it is not an if, it's just when. And it is all about creating those ecosystems as we, mm -hmm. this is the main theme of our today's conversation, whether that's hardware, sensors, connectivity, or even applications, or the tools for developers. You need to create that ecosystem because it will yes. grow because Apple themselves, they won't be able to develop that many applications that was provided by developers worldwide. And Correct. Right. Correct. Yeah, the power of the community is 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 what has to be harnessed in order to accelerate innovation, right? There's no such thing as a single company like Apple or even Google or Microsoft that can singularly develop develop and deliver all the value. That doesn't make economic sense. It was a pleasure talking to you. What's the best way for the listeners to follow you and to essentially learn from your expertise? I'm accessible via email, john at nextwave.partners, and I publish all of my research openly on johncowan.online. Perfect. I, I will put a link to the article that I was referring to, to the show notes, because uh, it is great read, and I strongly recommend everyone to take a minute and uh, read it, because you provide tons of value. Uh, john, thank you so much for today's conversation. It was a pleasure talking to you and I hope that we'll have opportunity to meet again in the future. Thank you, Lucas. I appreciate you sending me the invite and it's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening. Go to thefingers.com to find more materials about the Internet of Things domain. My name is Lukasz Malinowski, the Internet of Things advisor and trainer. I've never worked for a, a large company unless it's through a joint venture or acquisition. I've been building early stage innovation for as long as I can remember, well over 20 years now. I work both for huge companies and startups. And to be honest, working for startups in that early stages is way more interesting in terms of the dynamic within the company. You really have to appreciate or love the idea of working somewhat independently and without, it's almost like I would, I would describe building early stage innovation companies as, as walking a tightrope with no net underneath you. Some people like the thrill of that. Other people would view that as way too risky. I just happened to figure out at a very young age that entrepreneurship was probably the right path for me. 
I was fortunate to figure that out in my early 20s, and I've been doing that ever since.